the Passover day, celebrating, happy-go-lucky, uh, have a big meal and eat and drink and laugh and visit, like the first day of unleavened bread is, like Pentecost is, like trumpets and the Feast of Tabernacles. But this day is a solemn occasion. The Passover day is the time when we look back at what the world thinks of as Good Friday. You know, you might ask yourself what was good about Good Friday. The Son of God was murdered on that day, supposedly. He was put to an accursed death by being hanged on a tree. He was rejected by his Father when he had the whole sin of the world put on him or forsaken for an instant. It seems the world has the unique ability to turn things upside down and backward. If God says, remember the seventh day, they say, no, remember the first day. If God says, three seasons in the year, you have all your feasts in the fall and in the summer and in the spring, they say, no, let's have them all in the winter. So everything the world seems to do turns God's way upside down. In fact, the men of God in the Bible were referred to on one occasion as those who turn the world upside down. And yet, one of the prophets said the world has been turned upside down. So the men of God come along and turn it back right side up. But to the other people, it doesn't look that way. I know there are people... I was visiting a little old lady this past week whose daughter is a Church of Christ lady, and she doesn't visit her mom, doesn't stay overnight with her, because she's not in the Church of Christ. She's one of those nutty Armstrong followers. And uh, if there's any way she could shut the work off the air, she'd do it. And she says if all the churches had gotten together and shut his mouth from the beginning, everybody had been a lot better off. Because we come around attacking historical Christianity, and really it isn't historical Christianity if you check real history. But it's traditional Christianity. It's hand-me-down Christianity. Now, you know, you take the example of the Passover. Everybody seems to know in their different churches that there ought to be an occasion when you commemorate the crucifixion, the resurrection. There ought to be something in all Christian worship that looks back to the crucifixion and the resurrection. So some people call it Mass. Some people call it Communion. Some people call it Eucharist. Some people call it Lord's Supper. Nobody calls it what the Bible calls it. You know, where'd we get these names anyway? Well, the word Eucharist, you might notice Matthew 15 and verse 36. Matthew 15 and verse 36. Here you find the Greek word Eucharist. Jesus took the seven loaves and the fishes and Eucharist. That's the word. Gave thanks. That's all the word means. Now, where in the world does the Bible ever tie Eucharist in with Christ's death and resurrection? It doesn't. Never does. But don't worry about that, you know. I mean, just because the Bible doesn't uh, tie in Eucharist with Passover or communion or the Lord's Supper or whatever, uh, the world takes it on itself to do that. So the term gave thanks in the Bible is the Greek word Eucharist. Now you might notice back here in Matthew 26, maybe this is the reason they adopted the word Eucharist as one of the synonyms for the spring memorial of the death and resurrection of Christ. Matthew 26, verse 26, as they were eating, they were eating, as we'll read a little later, the Passover, Jesus took bread and blessed, break it, gave it to the disciples, and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, Eucharist. So because he took the bread and the cup and gave thanks, 
they take the Greek word gave thanks and use that as the title for this commemoration or this memorial. And yet, what does the Bible name it? Gave thanks is just a verb. And gave thanks is used all the way through the Bible without any reference to this individual day or this particular event. It's used in every place for a term of giving thanks. Well, what about the word communion? You know, where do we get communion as a name for this spring occasion? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10, beginning verse 14, Paul says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, you judge what I say. The cup of blessing, which we bless, or the cup of Eucharist, giving thanks or blessing, same term, same word, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So the world takes a verse like that and says, see that Eucharist, that giving thanks, over the cup and over the bread, that's communion. It's the communion of the body of Christ and the communion of the blood of Christ. So they take a term out of the verse and name the commemoration, the memorial or the commemoration communion. Now you can find the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I won't turn and read these, verse 14. In 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. So here you see why the world takes terms like Eucharist, communion, and attaches it to this memorial or this commemoration. Now, the other name is right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is a real eye-opener to me when, after having been a Baptist some 20 years, I heard a broadcast and got a little booklet and began to read this book with how often should you take the Lord's Supper? Now, by the title, I thought, well, how often? We Baptists took it quarterly. But I knew the Church of Christ took it weekly. And, you know, some churches you can take it biannually or triannually. Some churches you can take it every day, every morning real early. So how often should you take the Lord's Supper? So I thought it was going to be some unknown scripture to me that would say six times a year, once a month, or uh, quarterly, like we did all along, and we'd be right. But to my surprise, you don't eat the Lord's Supper at all. That was a real coming in the back door. I hadn't anticipated that at all. But notice 1 Corinthians 11. Paul starts out in verse 17 with this new paragraph, this new part of this chapter. Now, in this that I'm about to declare to you, He'd been praising them earlier for some of their examples of work and love and vigor. But now what he's going to say to them, it isn't going to be a praise. In this that I declare, I praise you not, that you assemble together, that you church, you come to church, not for the better, but for the worse. Now, that's hard to imagine that anybody could assemble together on Passover and instead of it being for the better, end up being for the worse. I mean, we sure don't want that to happen. We only get to come together on Passover once a year. So we certainly don't want to come together for the worse, but we want to come together for the better. So after you leave the Passover, it should strike you, it should have resulted in betterment, coming together for the better. And now he mentions why it didn't, do what it should have done. First of all, the reason it ended up being the worse instead of the better, first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be schisms among you, party spirits, divisions, cliques, and I partly believe it. So if people come together for Passover and there are cliques and party spirits and sects and schisms in the body, they're going to come together for the worse and not for the better. And Paul said he partly believed it. It had been exaggerated or probably wasn't as bad as people would have it be. There must also be heresies among you. 
You know, that's always a frightening uh, verse to me, that there must also be heresies among you. Now, why in the world would that be the case? Well, looking back over the years I've been in the church, I've seen how God has forced out a reality that some people weren't really converted who might have thought they were, that some people were trying to live God's way without God's Spirit. Some people had just maybe followed their mate into the church. But one way or another, there must also be heresies among you. And notice the reason then. That they which are approved may be made manifest among you. That's why God allows that to happen in the church. People coming in with opinions. People coming in with their set ideas. People coming in that don't believe all the way the way we do. There must be heresies that they which are approved may be made manifest. So people who really are converted and really filled with God's Spirit, who are really wrapped up in God's way of life, that'll be made manifest, but others will fall by the wayside, and it'll be manifest that all that are among us aren't of us. Well, he goes on to say, when you come together, therefore, into the one place, when you assemble in the church assembly, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, that is exactly what that Greek verse says. And you might even notice it in the margin. My Bible in the margin says, when you come together, therefore, into one place, you cannot eat the Lord's Supper. You cannot eat the Lord's Supper. It's not what it is. And the point he's bringing out here is that they were at fault for trying to make it like the Old Testament meal. They were at fault because they couldn't catch the newness of the meaning of what they were doing. In the Old Testament, they had the bread and the wine. You know, that wasn't some new invention. In fact, I might just read to you out of this uh, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary here on this one statement. Exodus 19, verse 1, In the third month, according to Jewish usage, the first day of that month, the same day, it's added to mark the time more explicitly. It was 45 days after Egypt, one day spent on the mount, one returning to the people's answer, three days of pre uh, preparation. So the whole time was 50 days from the first Passover to the promulgation of the law. Hence, the Feast of Pentecost, the 50th day, was the inauguration of the Old Testament church, and the divine wisdom is apparent in the selection of the same reason for the institution of the New Testament church. <clears throat> so he shows how the Passover is tied in with Pentecost. Then he mentions here, when they took the cup, that they had a cup of blessing with the Passover of the Old Testament. And when they took the unleavened bread, they'd had that all along in their way of observing the Passover in the Old Testament. So when Christ took the bread and blessed the cup, that didn't strike them a bit as being anything different. They'd always had that. If you were to visit a Jewish home this spring season, you'd find the father, the oldest member of the family present, would pronounce a blessing on the cup and pass it around. Little kids from four years old on would take a sip of it. And then he would pronounce a blessing on the Passover loaf, on the matzahs. And surely we realize when you go down to the store and you see the uh, word matzah, that is the Hebrew word unleavened. Now, in the Hebrew language, it's spelled M-A-T-S-T-S-A-H. But in English, we'd write it matzah. But that's what that word means, unleavened. In the Greek language, the word for unleavened bread is azumos, A-Z-U-M-O-S. Apparently, the converted Jews were so uh, steeped for years in the Old Testament way of having the Passover that they couldn't get it into their heads as to the real spiritual New Testament meaning of the bread and the wine. So they were going right on in their stained Old Testament 
habit for years and trying to make it the Lord's Supper. So Paul is making an issue out of the fact that when they came together on that solemn night, they could not eat the Lord's Supper. It wasn't the purpose of it. It in no way was to be a supper. You know, when you come to Passover, and you take that little bitty glass of wine and you take the little bitty chip of unleavened bread, there's no way on earth you could call that a supper. You know, the word supper means the biggest meal of the day. If you eat your biggest meal of the day, you have supper at noon. If that's when you eat your biggest meal. If you eat your biggest meal at breakfast, that's really supper. And if you eat your biggest meal in the evening, that's supper. So whichever meal is the biggest meal of your day, that's supper. So when they came together for this memorial, this commemoration, they were condemned for making it a supper. They were bringing judgment on themselves for making it a supper. They could not eat the Lord's Supper. And yet that's what I thought I did for 20 years as a Baptist. Four times a year, ate the Lord's Supper. But to my surprise, that wasn't the case at all. And there's the, one of the other terms. Now, surely we realize when we think about Mass, and you think about December the 25th, Christ's Mass. That's where we get the word Christmas. Christ's Mass. The high Mass of the year at Christmas time. Well, where do we get names like these anyway? We just pick them out of a verse and put them on. What are we doing? Why are we trying to avoid the name the Bible uses for the event. You know, the uh, number of times in the New Testament you find the word Passover is quite interesting because in the Old Testament, the word Passover is used 47 times in the Old Testament. Now, if you take a concordance and you look up Passover, you'll find it referred to 28 times in the New Testament. But you add 47 and 28, you come up with 75. Now, you know, what's significant about the number 75? Well, it's five fifteens. It doesn't mean anything. It's three twenty-fives. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, 75, that's not a significant number. And yet the Passover is one of the very key ordinances of the church of God. So there must be something amiss when you add up the numerical pattern of a key term like that, and it doesn't ring. It doesn't fit. Of course, the answer is back here in Acts 12. You might just turn there and notice this is one way you can know when the Bible's been tampered with by the very numerical pattern God put through the Bible. <clears throat> Acts chapter 12. About that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now imagine this is in the book of Acts. Eleven years after Christ had died and nailed everything to the cross, he nailed to the cross. And it still says, then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended Peter... He put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers, in other words, four companies of four each, to keep him, intending after Easter. Boy, the Bible does talk about Easter. I mean, there it is, right there in your own King James translation, Easter. The only trouble, if you check this word Easter in a concordance, it shows you the word is Pasha, which is the word Passover. And if you add this one to the other 75, you get 76, which is 4 times 19. Of course, the number 19 is a perfect cycle in the heavenly cycles of the stars, the planets, the sun, and the moon. And the perfect cycle is 19 years. And of course, the number 4 is the number of God revealing himself, such as the four gospel writers and the four trumpets and so many cases where you find the four. Four living creatures. But four is a real significant number all the way through the Bible associated with God revealing himself. Uh, look at the 40s. 40, four times ten. Saul ruled 40 years. And David ruled 40 years. And Solomon ruled 40 years. 
And what happened when Abraham was 120? And 400 years between the Old and the New Testaments. Always multiples of fours connected with God revealing himself. So when you add up all of the words for Passover, sure enough, you come out with a very key number, 76. But if this word were translated Easter here, really, it would botch up the whole numerical system God has through the Bible. And any commentary admits this word should be Passover, Pasha. So can you imagine then, we've seen where the word communion is used. We've seen what the word Eucharist means. We've seen the word Lord's Supper is only mentioned once in the Bible, and it says you can't eat it, you can't take it. And yet, in the New Testament only, 29 times in the New Testament only, the word Passover appears. So why should anybody scratch their head and wonder, what do you call this annual commemoration of the death of Christ? You know, where in the Bible did Christ show we should commemorate his resurrection? Where does it show that we should have any kind of a celebration of the resurrection? But he did say we should celebrate the Lord's death till he comes again. Now, you might uh, come back to 1 Corinthians 11 and notice what it says back here then. 1 Corinthians 11. One of the real exciting studies I had in the Bible in my life in the past, I took the concordance, I looked up the word Baal, I looked up the word Ashtaroth, Astarte. Really an interesting study. I marked all the way through my Bible, sun, big letters, where they referred in any way to anything that was connected with sun worship. I'd suggest when you get a chance and you want to have a real interesting Bible study, Launch into that. Delve into that, because it's really interesting. I might just give you a couple of beginners on here. Like the word Easter. You know, does it ever dawn on kids at school? Does it ever dawn on relatives? Hey, where did we get that word Easter? Hey, what in the world has that word Easter got to do with resurrection? Is that word Easter the Hebrew word for resurrection? Is that how we got that? What's that word Easter got to do with a spring commemoration? of the death and burial and resurrection of the Son of God. Anything to do with that? Well, uh, let's just look up the word. Of course, if you look it up in the dictionary, it'll show you it's the English form of the Hebrew term Ashtaroth, Astarte. And even in your Bible, under the word Ashtaroth, Ashtoreth, Astaroth, A-S-T-A-R-O-T-H, A-S-H-T-A-R-O-T-H, or A-S-H-T-O-R-E-T-H. It's a Hebrew word that means a wife. So that goddess was a female. That goddess was a wife, a woman. Now, here's what the Young's Concordance says about it. An idol of the Philistines, Phoenicians, Zidonians, worshipped by Israel soon after the death of Joshua, and also worshipped by Solomon. So Solomon kept Easter Sunday. So did the Zidonians and the Phoenicians and the Philistines and the Christians in our day. But can you imagine it happening that soon? Judges 2 verse 13 says, Israel forsook the eternal and served Baal. And of course, all you've got to do is look up Baal. That's a male name, and that's the sun god, the Baal, the sun god. He was the man. He was married to Ashtaroth, Easter, the wife, the moon goddess. Well, one other uh, term you might find interesting to look up is O-N, on, which is a Hebrew word that means sun. This city of On was the capital of Lower Egypt, named after the sun because that was the whole power of Lower Egypt, depended on the sun. East of the Nile, a little north of Memphis. It's also called Heliopolis, as well as Beth Shemesh, House of the Sun. So over and over again, you find many places named by names that related to the sun god and the moon goddess. 
as well as the other hosts of heaven. But it's a quite a vigorous study. It'll take you days to just run through how many places Israel forsook a living God, a creator God, and went out and served nature, worshipped the sun and the moon and the stars, worshipped the zodiac. Now, we're not to do that. The Bible calls this spring memorial Passover. Twenty-nine times in the New Testament. That number doesn't mean anything. Twenty-nine. Forty-seven in the Old doesn't mean anything. But you put them together. And, you know, that's the way numbers work. Many words, if you looked up the many times they're used in the Old Testament, the number isn't significant at all. You know, what's significant about three times thirteen? You might think, boy, that's triply unlucky or something. That's spooky. That's bad, three thirteens. But not when you add it with 47 out of the Old Testament. And it shows how the Old and New have to fit together. They have to be taken all as one. You can't divide them. Now, let's come back to this event called the Passover and take a little look at this example here in 1 Corinthians 11. We've read down as far as verse 20. So let's pick up there and go ahead and read a little further then. When you come together, therefore, into one place, when you assemble, when you're together in the church, all those three terms used interchangeably here in these verses, you can't eat the Lord's Supper. But the way you people are doing it and ending up for the worse instead of the better, everyone's taking before somebody else his own supper. Naturally, the people who have more to eat have more, and the ones that don't have as much, some are hungry and some are stuffed and gluttonous. Others are drunk on grape juice, if you can imagine that, and others are thirsty. Now, he says, what? Notice that just shocked Paul. It stunned Paul. He couldn't believe that. You can imagine when you hear something, you say, what? You know, how shocked you are. How surprised and astonished. Why, that can't be. What? Why, you've got houses to eat and drink in. Why would you come and make this Passover some kind of a supper? Why, that should not be. You ought to eat your suppers at home. And then come and take these memorials seriously with the right attitude. You've got houses to eat and drink in. If you come to the Passover and make it a supper, you're despising the church of God and you're shaming those that don't have. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise not. So Paul is really worked up about these people's attitude about coming to take the Passover. To them it wasn't any big serious matter. And yet in Paul's sight, he knew people were dying in his churches because they were taking it in a wrong way. He knew that people were sitting in his church agonizing with pain and sickness and ailment and disease that they could have been healed of if they'd have taken that Passover seriously. But they weren't doing it. So Paul was really moved in the way he said this. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I should say not. I can't praise at all. Now he goes back to how apparently when he was the three years in the desert, Christ taught him personally. and He wasn't taught by the other apostles. He wasn't taught by men. He received this directly from Christ. I have received of the Lord that which I also deliver to you. So, you know, here Paul, several years later, was taught by Christ, apparently in a vision in the desert, and it fits exactly what Christ taught the disciples when he was here on the earth. So how can you say like a Baptist, like I did for 20 years, that the things Christ lived when he was here humanly, physically on the earth, all of that was ended when he was crucified, and everything was new? Well, how can that be? Here, Christ gave Paul this manner of keeping this memorial, and yet it was just exactly what he'd given to those disciples before he died. 
you know, it doesn't make sense for people to say, well, yeah, but you don't need to worry about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because Jesus, being a Jew, uh, naturally followed all that. But, you know, when he died, he nailed all that to the cross. And we just go by the book of Acts and see what the New Testament church did after Christ's death because everything up until his death, we don't, we don't account. And that's what the church is saying. But that's not true. Because Paul was told exactly the same things years later in his personal teaching from Christ in the desert that Christ taught the disciples when he was there literally. So he goes on to say now, I have received of the Lord that which I also deliver to you in Christians, that the Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, and that's always emphasized in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that it was the night in which he was betrayed that he took the bread. He wasn't killed the same night. He wasn't crucified until the next afternoon at the time the Jews always kill their uh, afternoon sacrifice. So the Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had Eucharist given thanks, he broke this bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now, of course, we know the some churches believe in what they call a big word of trans, substantiation. In other words, the word trans means cross, and substance, you know what the word substance means. So what they're saying by that big word transubstantiation is that a priest, by asking a blessing on that bread and wine, can actually change that. He can cross that over from the literal physical substance of bread and wine and turn it into blood and flesh. A miracle of transubstantiation. Every morning when the priest pronounces the blessing on the cup and the bread, he's working a miracle, changing bread into flesh and changing wine into blood. Now, of course, some churches took them to task way back in the Middle Ages. In fact, one person I thought came up with a real good test. He said, all right, you say that after you've pronounced that blessing on that bread and wine, that literally becomes the flesh and blood of Christ. Is that right? Then let's just pour a little strychnine in that wine, and when you bless it, it'll be changed to blood, and you can drink it later, and it won't hurt you, okay? Well, you know, they wouldn't do it. No way they're going to have somebody put strychnine in that uh, wine and prove they can make it into blood. But I thought that was a pretty slick test. <laughs> if they can really do it, who'd worry about it, you know? So if you can change wine into blood, you can tra change strychnine into blood, too. Well, anyway... They take the term, this is my body, as if you have to take that literally. Now, all you have to do to disprove that is take a whole bunch of other scriptures where Jesus said, the seed is the sons of the kingdom. That can't be. The seed represents the sons of the kingdom. The seed isn't sons. That's, that's impossible. And there are many places in Christ's teachings where he said, this is, and it's obvious, it meant this represents. In fact, you might remember back in Matthew 26, after Christ had already blessed the cup, he handed it to them and said, I'll not drink any more of this fruit of the vine. He still called it wine after he already blessed it. I guess he just slipped up there. You know, he should have said, I'll not drink any more of this blood until I do it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And of course, that's ignoring the fact that in the Old Testament law, you could not drink blood anyway. In the Old Testament law, you could not eat flesh. That was totally forbidden by the law of God, to eat human flesh or to drink blood. So what did Christ do? Just contradict his own law and say, well, yeah, I normally shouldn't. But in this case, after the priest makes that into blood and flesh, that's okay. This is different. Well, that, I mean, if you want to believe that, why, well, you, you've got a lot of things like that to try to answer. Well, anyway, back here to the story. When he had Eucharist, he broke and said, take, eat. This represents, this is a symbol of my body, which is broken for you. Now, you know, most commentaries I've read, none of them catch the fact that the breaking of the bread was related to healing. 
They don't associate healing at all with this spring memorial of this death and uh, crucifixion and murder of the Savior. But he said, this broken bread represents my body broken for you. This do in remembrance, as a memorial, as a commemoration of me. Now, there's a very specific command. This do. This do in, mem- in remembrance, as a memorial. Now, where does he say that about uh, resurrection? You know, what do you take to symbolize resurrection? There's no place in the Bible that it says, by this you commemorate the Lord's resurrection till he comes again. It never says that anywhere. There's no statement anywhere in the Bible to commemorate the resurrection. But it says, this is a memorial, a commemoration, this do. Well, then after the same manner also, he takes the cup when he'd supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Now, you know, you take that word literally. You're standing there with a, what, silver chalice or golden cup, whatever, you know, people want to make something out of the cup. You could use the Dixie cup. It wouldn't make any difference. not the cup that's important anyway. It's what you're showing by it. But, you know, people talk about what you use. And some churches make a big argument. They only have one cup there, because after all, look at there, it doesn't say drink these cups, it says this cup, so everybody's got to drink out of the same cup, and that's kind of hazardous to do if it's grape juice, especially if you just happen to have a flu epidemic in the springtime when that Passover season comes around. But nonetheless, notice what he said here, this cup is the New Testament. In my blood. Now, there's no way you can take that literally. You cannot have any New Testament floating around in your blood. And you can't say this cup is the New Testament. That cup isn't the New Testament. Matthew to Revelation. Those conditions are conditions of the New Testament. That cup isn't the New Testament. And the New Testament isn't literally in your blood either. So it it proves right in the context that you don't take that and force it literally, this cup represents the New Testament. This cup is a commemoration. It's a symbol or a token. It typifies the New Covenant, which is in the blood of Christ. That's what's the New Covenant. This do you as off as you drink. Now, can you imagine all churches take how often they take this memorial from that one verse, as often as they said it, some quarterly, some triannually, some biannually, some weekly, some daily. They all take it from that one verse. But what does that verse really say? Is that verse telling you how often to take it? Or is that verse just telling you, this do you in remembrance of me as often as you do it? That isn't saying how often to do it. It's just saying, be sure that you always do it in commemoration of me. No matter if you take it 20 years, if you take it 50 years. No matter, don't let familiarity come into it. However many times you might be around to eat that bread and drink that cup, do it in remembrance of Christ. Don't do it as a supper. Don't do it and shame the church by some having too much to eat and drink, and others not having much at all. You're supposed to eat and drink at home and then come and take this memorial. Now, you know, one way I've illustrated that, if I told my wife, now look, every time you go downtown, don't go down State Street. That's dangerous. That is wild. That is terrible. You're tempting God. Don't, every time you go to town, am I telling her how often to go to town? You know, what would, what would you think? If I said, well, now, Maxine, every time you go to town, go around on Halstead or something, you know. Then she said, I'm going to go to town all I want to. You can't tell me how many times to go to town. You know, I just stand there like, well, what are you talking about? I can't tell you how often to go to town. I just said, as often as you go to town. 
However often you go, I'm not telling you how often to go. I'm just saying as often as you go to town, go that way, don't go this way. But, you know, people can't take common sense, and why they call it that, I don't know. You know, they call it horse sense, but it, you shouldn't call it common sense because it isn't very common. But anyway, notice what he said. As oft as you drink it. It's not telling you how often to drink it. You have to find somewhere else that tells you how often to drink it. And there are places that tell you how often. I mean exactly. So he's just telling them here, as often as you drink this cup, you show the Lord's death. You be sure that it's in, in remembrance of me. Now verse 26. For, in other places, this same Greek phrase is translated every time you eat this bread. As often as you eat this bread. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show, same word as remember up above, commemorate, celebrate, remember, you show or commemorate or remember the Lord's death till he come. So that very plainly tells us that we should be doing this until the Lord comes. We should be showing, commemorating, remembering the Lord's death till he comes. But it never says that about the resurrection anywhere. Now, after those kind of instructions, look at the next verses. And this is what we want to be sure we're all thinking about. Now, you know, how many of us are worthy to take the Lord's Supper? You've got to get yourself worthy before you come, you know. You've got to be sure you're worthy. Is that right now? You know, is that, is that what enters our minds every year before Passover? Well, you know, I'm not worthy to take it. Well, the longer you're converted, the least worthy you're going to feel to take it. So if you keep waiting till you feel worthy to take it, you might as well forget about it. You never are going to feel worthy to take it. In fact, every year I've taken it, I felt like I needed it more. I needed it more. I couldn't wait. I was more eager and more anxious. And you know, even Jesus said, with desire, I have desired to eat this with you. That's what he told the disciples. That's the attitude people ought to have when they come to Passover, how much they need it. How much they desire to take it because they know how much they need it. Now, notice what he says here then. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. That's a key word. That is not an adjective. It is not describing the eater or the taker. It's describing the verb of how you take it. And that's the whole key in a nutshell right there. You're never worthy to take it. We don't take it because we're worthy. We don't take it when we're worthy. We can't be like some, you know. They come together every year at the spring season, and everybody says, Well, now, let's see. Am I one of the 144,000? If I am, I'll take the cup. And if I'm not, then I shouldn't take the cup. Now, they've never published how many take it each year. I mean, you know, I'd be dumbfounded if 144,000 exactly took it. But only those who feel like they're among the 144,000 should take it. Of course, if you're Jehovah's Witness. But anyway, notice what he says here. Whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, it doesn't say unworthy. One little letter makes a world of difference. It says unworthily. It's an adverb describing how you do it. Not an adjective describing the doer. Now, what happens if you eat that bread and drink that cup unworthily? You shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean if somebody is real worked up and sensitive and nervous and they drop that little glass and it shatters on the floor and, you know, they're a murderer. They just got through shedding the blood of Christ again. And, you know, it isn't as if we've got this one big cup up here everybody drinks of, and if a drop rolls down the side and falls on the floor, boy, somebody's guilty of the blood of Christ. But that's the way it's been advocated in the past. That's the way some Christian churches teach it and believe it. But notice, when you're guilty, it's a lot easier to be guilty than you think. If you eat that bread and drink that cup unworthily, you can be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. 
Now, how do you do it unworthily? Well, he's going to tell you. The best way to be sure you don't do it unworthily, he says, the next verse, let a man examine himself. Look into your heart. Check up on your attitude. Look into your innermost realizations and feelings. Every person, man, woman, anybody, let everyone examine himself. Now, as you go through this process in the next weeks of examining yourself, what should that do to you? Well, some of you ought to make you get baptized. Some of you ought to make you realize that to miss the Passover is a big thing because you've got to wait another year before you get to have the Passover. Now, of course, there are a few exceptions that you can take it a month late, but they're not the conditions of not being baptized in time to take it the first time. But now he says, after everybody examines themselves, to be sure they're not going to take it unworthily, to be sure they won't be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, once you examine yourself, notice that examination ought to cause... I mean, you just shouldn't go. You might as well just toss in the towel. Well, you've been around for so many years and look at you. Now, that isn't what this verse says. This verse says, everybody should examine himself and then go ahead and take it. But don't take it without examining yourself. Don't take it lightly or take it half-heartedly or take it as if you should be worthy. That's not the question. Examine yourself and so let him eat of bread and drink of that cup. So that's the admonition there. All of us ought to be examining ourselves. Some of you ought to be being baptized, too, between now and the Passover. And some shouldn't be. But we all ought to be examining ourselves before we come to this Passover. So we won't eat and drink unworthily. So we will eat and drink after we've examined ourselves. Now, what should that examination be? What should it prove? What should it bring out? What are you looking for? Well, he tells you a little bit here in the next verses. First, he warns you that anybody that does eat and drink unworthily, it isn't light matter. If anybody eats and drinks unworthily, they eat and drink, and there, there's a terrible mistranslation of the Greek word krino, K-R-I-N-O, that means judgment. doesn't mean damnation. You don't eat and drink damnation to yourself. But you know, people have had Christians so scared in the past, in the Middle Ages, and even in our day, that somebody would come to communion or they'd come to the Lord's Supper or they'd come to the Eucharist, whatever they call it, and they'd be so scared that they would just be almost getting ulcers, just overcoming at communion time, quarterly or whatever it is. But you don't eat and drink damnation, but you do eat and drink judgment. God judges you when you come to appear before him on Passover night. And you can eat and drink judgment on yourself you can bring things on yourself by being there and taking it unworthily. Now, notice the whole key is the last part of that verse 29. How do you eat and drink unworthily? How do you eat and drink judgment on yourself? There's the statement. Not discerning the Lord's body. That's the whole key right there. That's how you do it. Not discerning the Lord's body. Now, you can look at that two or three different ways, too. What do you mean, not discerning the Lord's body? And I've seen the church go through stages of understanding on that very phrase there. I know, you know, it used to be that men would, at Passover time, they'd study a lot of the agonizing brutality of scourging. They'd study all of the horror of the crucifixion. And when it came time to get people's minds on Passover, they'd get up with a very descriptive adjective uh picture and tell you how Christ's flesh was ripped from his body and how these thongs had uh, metal hooks in them and how, you know, what it's like to be crucified. And Is that discerning the Lord's body? I mean, should we get into a, a gory, uh, gut-wrenching horror picture of the agony Christ went through? On Good Friday? I mean, that sure make it not a Good Friday. 
Well, that isn't what it means. What does it mean, discerning the Lord's body? Well, the church is the body of Christ. Does that mean all you've got to do is be sure it's in the right church? To be sure you're celebrating this once a year in the church of God? Not discerning the Lord's body? I think it means that partly because all those Lord's suppers I took in the Baptist church, that was just good grape juice and crackers. That's all that was. You know, that didn't... Uh, what did that do? Now, maybe I was learning something in a sense by having to think about that, but as far as God supernaturally being alive in my life and doing things in me because of that, that wasn't the case at all. Not discerning the Lord's body. How can somebody do that without God's Spirit? I can write, read all kinds of books written about Passover, which I've been trying to do, and I've never found one yet that can visualize the scourging connected with healing. Now, what if you come to take the Passover, and you don't have one bit of realization that God is the eternal healer, God is the great physician, God is the one who's healing us by his stripes. What if you come to take the Passover and you don't have one ounce of faith in God at all as a healer? Now, I know we have man is able to do what man can do, but what God does, man can't do. And what man can't do, God does. But when you come for Passover, are you going to have any remembrance of healing? Are you going to have any faith in God as a healer? Are you going to realize that that's why Christ was scourged? That's why you break that bread? Or do you come with our Protestant backgrounds like these Jews did with their Jewish background and sit there and as that bread is broken, say, oh yeah, that pictures Christ's death, how he was weakened by beating and then his blood was out from the spear in his side and that's how he died. So that's all that is a picture of is Christ's death. And you don't even think about healing at all the whole night while you're there. You're going to take it unworthily. You're not discerning the Lord's body if you do that. The people that take it without realizing a part of this memorial and commemoration is connected with healing are taking it unworthily. Now, you read on, it proves that. What if you took that cut and that bread without just really thinking about Christ's death and what all he went for, through for you? Would that make many weak and sickly? How in the world would that be? Because of the spiritual lack of realization, it causes you physical weakness and sickliness? No, no, no. That's not what he's saying here. If you don't discern the Lord's body and have that faith in Christ's stripes for your healing, you'll go on weak and sickly when you could be healed. And you'll let men try things you think they can do and you'll waste your money. Because there are things men can do, and there are things men can't do they think they can do, and you think they can do, and you don't know they can't do it, you try it. And I know that's what's going to happen with a lot of people as they begin to realize that man, we should go to man for him to do what he can do. What can he do? That's a big problem, you know. How do you know what they can do, and how do you know what they can't do? Well, let's read the rest of this. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you Corinthian Christians. Having God's Spirit, being members of God's church, for this cause, many are weak and sickly because you don't discern the Lord's body when you come into the one place to take the Passover. When you break the bread and you eat the bread, and you don't discern the Lord's body, for that cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And I had a chance this past week to visit a little old lady that hadn't been visited. and Her daughter, the one I was mentioning before, being the Church of Christ uh, lady. And she was stoop-shouldered over like this. And she said, uh, do, you, do you all have a healing service? And I said, well, not as such. We believe in anointing the sick. And she said, well, I know the Bible teaches that 
uh, you use olive oil and lay hands on the sick and that God heals. And I know that, you know, she wore this metal brace to keep her back straight and it wore out and she couldn't get another one. And she said, I know God could just straighten that up. I know I just need to be anointed and put it in God's hands and ask God to heal me. And I know I'll just be able to walk straight because, you know, walking over like that, I get cricks in my neck and I it bothers me to do my daily chores around the house. And I said, well, I'll run out the car and get the olive oil and we just anoint you and ask God to heal you right here. And so we just kneel there in the little apartment, anoint her and help her up after she's anointed. And she just stood straight up like this and, you know, moved her back around a little bit and said, boy, I sure am happy about that. You know, I sure appreciate that. And I knew God could do it, and I know man doesn't do it, but I just felt like I should be anointed, and I'm thankful to God that he's done it, and I'm sure it'll be straight from now on, and I won't have any any trouble that way. And You know, there's a little old lady who never been to church. She went once to Abilene years ago, but she had faith that was a joy for me to sit and listen to. But notice, if we don't have faith, we can go on weak and sickly next year. We can go on. Even some of us could die when we could live longer. Now, you may die in the faith and still be in God's kingdom, but if you could live longer, you might be able to grow more and be in a higher position in God's kingdom. So it isn't, it isn't as if by taking the Lord's Supper unworthily, you're going to be in a car wreck or God's going to get you for that, as they sing every day, you know, in the song. That isn't true at all. When you come to eat the Lord's Supper or the Passover and you take it unworthily and you don't discern the Lord's body, you're just not getting all the blessing God would like to give you. You're going to go on weak and sickly and maybe die next year when you could stay alive longer. So that's the only judgment he mentions. He doesn't mention in here uh, angels, the death angel is going to pass on you and get you. That doesn't say that at all. Now notice as he go on, goes on, if we would judge, that's the same word as damnation up above, the Greek word krino. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So we got to examine ourselves and judge ourselves. And if we do, then we won't be judged by having weakness and sickness and death come on us next year. But even when God judges us, when we take it unworthily, what is he doing? He's just chastening you. Even when you're judged for taking it unworthily. It's just going to be for your chastening. That's all it is. Not your damnation. Not your destruction. You're not going to be excommunicated and cut off forever. If you judge yourselves, then you won't have to be judged. But even if God judges you, it's just for your chastening that you shouldn't be condemned of the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, Wait on one another. Have a service, serving attitude toward one another. And if any man's hungry, well, you ought to eat at home before he comes. And then when you come together, it won't be the judgment. Here again, the same Greek word, and it's translated three different ways in five verses. No wonder people get mixed up about the Bible. That's the same word exactly, translated three ways. And the rest I'll set in order when I come. Now, back in John 13, there's one of the passages we're going to read when we come together for that Passover. John 13. Before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world of the Father. And then during that Old Testament uh, Passover supper, the devil had put into Judas Iscariot's heart to betray him, and Jesus knew that. So Christ rises from this supper, the old cup and bread and bitter herbs and roast lamb, and he lays aside his garments and takes a towel and girds himself. Now, this is unique again. Nobody does this hardly on the face of the earth, except God's people. And after that, he pours water into a basin and begins to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Now, you might think that's common, but that isn't common at all. That is something new, but it's not totally new. It's kind of a take off on something. Notice back in Genesis 18. Genesis 18, the Eternal appears to 
him in the plains of Mamre, and here Abraham sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day, siesta time. He lifts up his eyes and looks, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he sees them, he runs to meet them from the tent door and bows himself toward the ground and says, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, pass not away, I pray you, from your servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. You notice the difference? The host, the hospitable brother, loving a stranger, offered water for him to wash his own feet. That's always the way they did it. The host didn't wash the guest's feet. The host just provided water for the guy to wash his own feet. So we'll fetch a little water, but you wash your own feet and then rest yourselves, and I'll fetch a morsel of bread, and we'll revive your hearts, and then you can go on. Now, again, you might notice in chapter 19, there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. He bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Would to God people were that way today. And that's something, those great men of humility. You ever read those speeches Abraham Lincoln wrote? If you people... Look, I'm not worthy to be president. I'm not qualified to be president. I don't have the talents to be president of this great country. No man does. Can you imagine politicians saying that in our day? I never heard one of them say, I'm not worthy. I'm not qualified. I never yet heard anybody say that. But look at these men back there. Great men. Bowing themselves. Saying to a total stranger, Lord. Well, you talk about an attitude. That's something else, isn't it? Well, that's the point of this foot washing service. People ought to get that kind of an attitude. Toward strangers, even. Not toward somebody you know and would have a reason to respect. He rose up to meet them. He bowed himself with his face toward the ground. A millionaire. Abraham and Lot were millionaires. You add up the stock that they had. They couldn't even get it all in one section of Palestine. He said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house. Boy, can you imagine anybody having that attitude today? I mean, how many people have you ever known in your whole life that have that attitude? You could count them on your fingers. And you know and you know that you know that, and I do too. Is that any attitude people have? You know, there's a guy up in Abilene. And he said, Hey, for the first time in our lives... We've got a guest room on our house, an extra bed, extra room. He said, here, I'm just going to give you a key, and you just, whenever you need a place to stay, come on there. And raid the ice box. You know, if we're not there, go right on in, stay there. Just help yourself. Now, that's the first time that's happened to me in many years. Can you imagine people having this kind of an attitude? Look at Lot, a millionaire, saying, My Lord's. Turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house. Tarry all night, stay all night, wash your feet. You'll rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, no, we'll abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly. He wouldn't have it that they wouldn't stay in his place. So he pressed on them. Now, I won't turn and read, but you can read the same in chapter 24 and verse 32. Chapter 43 and verse 24. But nobody ever expected the host to wash the people's feet. He, at most, just provided water for them to wash their own feet. Now back to John 13. Jesus, the Son of God, the Eternal of the Old Testament, the Creator of all things, the Almighty, the ever-living God, the shield and the buckler and puts a towel around his waist, pours water into a basin, begins to wash dusty feet of disciples and wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And he comes to Simon Peter. And Peter says to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Kind of like John the Baptist. Remember when Christ came to John the Baptist? And he said, Lord, do you come to me to be baptized? I need to be baptized of you. Same attitude John the Baptist had. It's a good attitude Peter had. Why, Lord, you wash my feet? 
Jesus answered and said to him, Well, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you'll know hereafter. Then Peter said, Well, you're never going to wash my feet. I just can't, I just can't allow you to wash my feet. I'm just, look, I'm a clod, I'm a nobody, and you're, you can't wash my feet. Well, Jesus answered him, Well, if I don't wash you, you don't have any part with me. Well, Peter didn't realize it was spiritual uh, talk he was giving here. So Simon Peter said, well, Lord, not just my feet. I mean, how about my mouth and the rest of me, my hands and my head and all of me? Well, then Jesus said, well, look, a guy that's bathed regularly in the Roman baths, he doesn't need except to have his feet washed, and he'll be clean every bit. But you're not all clean. Of course, there he meant the individual and not a part of their body. Well, he knew who it would betray him. You're not all clean. That's why he said that. So after he'd washed their feet and took his garments and was set down again, he says, do you know what I've done to you? You call me master, and you call me Lord. And you say, well, because I am. Well, if I then, your Lord and master, if I've washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. Now, nobody wants to take that literally. I mean, now, well, wait a minute now. You know, can you imagine people who are born-again Christians being willing to squat down and put a towel around their waist and take somebody else's shoes off and socks off and put their feet in the basin and wash it with water and put their socks and shoes back on them again? Can you imagine what it would be if all the churches that are Christian churches were forced to do that beginning this next Sunday? I mean, you talk about a change. Talk about a difference. But Jesus said, you ought to wash one another's feet. And somebody that's converted, they just say, yes, sir, okay. And I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. Verily, verily, I say to you, the servant's not greater than his Lord. And yet on their way up to this Passover, they'd argued among themselves which was the greatest. If you can imagine that. Even while they were on their way up to take this, they were disputing among themselves which one was the greatest. And, of course, James and John's mother comes and asks Jesus to let them be on his right and left hand. And at least three different occasions, he sat a little child among them. One time it was Peter's little boy and said, uh, See that little child? Unless you receive the kingdom like a little child, you're never going to be there. Unless you get the attitude of little children, you know, you're not going to make it. Now, you can imagine if Jesus warned the disciples that way, then who are we to kind of sit around? Well, we got it made, you know. Just stay in the church, Lynn, and hang in there, and you got it made. No, you don't either. Christ said, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that's sent greater than he that sent him. And notice his closing statement there. If you know these things, you can be happy if you do them. But to know and not do, how much misery that causes people. You've got to do what you know. And when you know the truth, you've got to do it. Or you're never going to be content, happy. You're going to have ulcers, worries, frets, stew. You're not going to be happy until you do what you know. Now, come back to Luke chapter 7. Luke 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees desired Jesus that he would eat with him. So Christ went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to food. Behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. Now, she knew Jesus was sitting here reclining at this meal in the Pharisee's house. So she brought an alabaster box of ointment. And she stood at Jesus' feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with tears. And she began to wipe his feet with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, that's not teaching humans to do that to other humans. That's not teaching lay members to do that to the priest or some big wheel or big shot. But what's the lesson here? What's the purpose of this story? Here was this woman, a sinner. Everybody knew she was a sinner. And she comes and stands at Jesus' feet weeping, washes his feet with the tears of her weeping, and wipes them with the hairs of her head, and kisses his feet, and anoints them with the ointment. When this Pharisee, who didn't Jesus, sees that, he doesn't dare say anything outwardly, because he knows this Jesus has a reputation of being kind of plain spoken, 
and he wasn't about to stick his neck out to get put in, put in his place. So he speaks within himself, saying, why, if this man really were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman that is. He would know what manner of woman that is. But, you know, the truth is Jesus really did know what manner of woman she was, and that guy didn't. That guy was only going by common knowledge, by the past. He was going by sight. He wasn't going by heart. Jesus really was the prophet, and he really did know what manner of woman that was. Because there was a woman heartbroken over the way she'd been. Tears. You know, what kind of woman is it that'll dry tears off of Jesus' feet with her hair and take a very precious, costly ointment and anoint his feet? What kind of a woman would that be? Well, Jesus really saw her the way she really was. This man didn't. And yet, his very statement was, if he really were a prophet, he'd really know what manner of woman this is that touches him, because she's a sinner. Well, not once she repented, she wasn't a sinner. And then Jesus answering said to him, he just knew his heart, Simon, I've got somewhat to say to you. Of course, he knew he wouldn't really know what he was thinking inside, so he just says, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor that had two debtors. The one owed him 500 pence and the other 50. And when they didn't have anything to pay, he just frankly forgave both of them. Now, you tell me which one of them would love him the most. Well, even this Pharisee said why, I suppose. And you notice even there, he's protecting himself, not going to stick his neck out. He's just going to be looking out for old number one. Don't, don't be dogmatic, you know. Don't be, don't be committal. Just kind of hedge around the mulberry bush. So he just says, I suppose he to whom he forgave most. And Jesus said to him, that you've rightly judged. Then he turns to the woman and says to Simon, See you, this woman? You're the one that doesn't really see her, Simon. I'm the one who really sees her. You thought I didn't really see her. Oh, yeah, I really see her. You don't really see her. I want you to look at this woman, Simon. I entered into your house. You... You didn't even give me any water for washing my feet, which is just common hospitality. But it's a token of humility. But this Pharisee, he was a big wheel. He was self-righteous. He was pompous. He was holier than everybody else. Boy, he didn't tolerate any humanity or weakness in anybody. He was so great. But Jesus said, look, Simon, I entered into your house. You didn't even give me water for my feet. But she's washed my feet with tears. You didn't even give me a towel to dry my feet after I washed them, but she's wiped them with the hairs of her head. You didn't even give me a common greeting kiss of a respect or a friendship, but this woman, since the time I came in, hadn't just given me a common greeting kiss, but she hadn't ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil, you didn't anoint. You remember the 23rd Psalm? You anoint my head with oil? But here he says, you haven't even anointed my head with oil. And that was a real special token of respect and humility for a host to do that. But this woman, she's anointed my feet with ointment. So I say to you, her sins, which are many, they're forgiven because she's sorry. She's grieved. She's repentant. But look at you, haughty, proud, self-righteous, holy Joe, I say to you, her sins, which are many, they're forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. So you notice he doesn't directly tell him your sins, which you don't see. That's a great lesson. There's no way you can ever tell somebody that's self-righteous. You can shout and yell. You can turn them off toward you. You can make them think you've got a personality conflict with them, they can hate you, but you cannot show somebody that's self-righteous that they are. Only until they really see God and see themselves compared to it can they believe it. Now, you look at Job. How many try to tell him? His friends, his neighbors. God Almighty inspired a young guy to go tell him. God tried to tell him. And until Job finally saw himself... You can't do that. Now, notice Jesus has the wisdom here. He just says, Her sins, which are many, they're forgiven, because she loves much. 
But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. To whom little is forgiven. That really means some people have more to forgive? Does that mean some of us don't have that big a reason to be as thankful because we don't have that much to forgive? That's not what that's trying to tell you. The more you realize that God has forgiven you, the more you realize how compassionate and loving and patient and gentle and kind God is, the more you love God. It's the more you realize He's forgiven you, the more you love God. It's not the more you sin, then the more you love Him after He forgives you. Did you say you found that to be true of Christians you've seen in the church? The ones who've gone the furthest into the deepest, into the worst sin, they are the ones that just love God the most. I hadn't seen that. I don't think you've seen that either. That isn't what he's saying. He's saying the person who's really aware of their sins and how much God has forgiven them, they're sorry and they're tearful. And, you know, when somebody is totally repentant, they don't justify it all. This woman would even pour precious ointment on his feet and dry his feet with her hair and kiss his feet. Now, that's total repentance. That's complete grief and sorrow over what you've done. And no excuse, no justification, no... Now, look, I'm, I'm somebody. You can't just disregard me as if I'm nobody. Total humility, total repentance doesn't have any self left in it to maintain their right. But Jesus doesn't say anything to the man except to whom little is forgiven, loves little. He said to her, your sins are forgiven. Well, then they begin to take him to task for forgiving sin. Now, let's come back in Matthew, this time in chapter 6. Matthew chapter 5, and then we'll get in chapter 6. Matthew 5, verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has ought against you. Now, notice what he's saying here. When you come to take this Passover service, when you come to present yourself before God, when you come to bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother, you've got an offense toward a brother. There's something inside you. There you remember that your brother has ought against you. You leave your gift first before the altar. Didn't going to do you any good to offer a gift before the altar when you're bitter about a brother, you're soured toward a brother. You might as well just go on and leave your gift there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then you come and offer your gift before the altar. Because what is Jesus' statement in the Lord's Prayer here in chapter 6? You forgive others and then God will forgive you. If you don't forgive men their trespasses, verse 14 of chapter 6, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So, you know, you can't come to Passover time and have a bad feeling toward a brother. You've got to get that straightened out first and then offer your gift on the altar. Because if you don't forgive, then God isn't going to be forgiving you. Now, a good example of that, there's one scripture here I want to, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18. It's kind of interesting passage. In a way, the King James doesn't bring out the full impact of it because Peter made a statement where he thought he was really being a spiritual example to everybody else. I mean, he just thought he was showing what a real spiritual giant he was. So verse 21 Matthew 18, then Peter comes to Jesus and says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? How about seven times? Isn't that really good, God? I'll just let a brother sin against me seven times and I'll just forgive him. How about that, God? Jesus says to him, I don't say to you until seven times, but until seventy times seven. 490 times. Now, can you really think of any brother you've forgiven 490 times? Well, I'm pretty sure my wife's forgiven me 490 times. And I'm pretty sure I've forgiven her 490 times. And I don't know, maybe even my, my kids, maybe my dad, 
my mom. But that's about it. I can't really think of other people. Now, maybe there, maybe there have been because 70 times 7. But the point of the story, Peter thought it was really being something. He states that if you can read this in the Greek with the emphasis the way it really is, that it, it's really something to forgive someone who's forget, who sinned against you seven times. But the wind really got let out of the bag when Jesus said, No, I, that's nothing, Peter. Seven times, that's nothing. How about 70 times seven? Now notice. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain man or king which would take account of his servants. So he begins to reckon. One's brought to him that owed him nine million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and i would sure hate to owe that much you know it plagues you to owe a hundred it plagues you worse to owe a few thousand but can you imagine owing somebody nine million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars but for as much as he had not to pay his lord commanded him to be sold and now you know that's what's happened to us because of our sin we've been sold into death. We've been sold into curses and plagues and sufferings and hardships and anguishes. And that's the point of this story. We don't realize what all God has forgiven us. We don't realize how much God has forgiven. And we need to realize how far we humans fall short of God's forgiveness. You know, God forgets when he forgives. But can you do that? Jesus forgot that Mary Magdalene had seven demons when he first met her and cast them out and healed her. He didn't remember that. Can you imagine what it had been like if every day after that Jesus walked around and said, Boy, you got to watch out for that Mary Magdalene. You know, she's kind of weak. Something's wrong with her. Remember, she used to have seven demons. But, you know, she became one of the top women in all of his acquaintances, the, the one he appeared to first after he was raised. And yet, look how she started. I'll tell you, when God forgives, he forgets. How would you think Paul would have felt all of the years he labored if he just kept remembering everybody he'd had put to death, everybody he'd imprisoned, all those saints he'd had locked up? What if God hadn't forgiven him and forgotten it? But you know, that's not the way we humans are. We don't forget. We don't forgive. We lie to ourselves. We say, well, I can forgive, but I just can't forget. You're lying. You can't forget. You can't forgive. You're not forgiving if you don't forget. So don't lie to yourself anymore by using that satanic proverb. That's not true. But we use that all the time. But notice the lesson here. You have sold yourself into a nine million two hundred and fifty thousand dollar debt. That's how much you owe God. That's how much God forgives you. When you come to take that Passover, it's as if you're just having a nine million two hundred and fifty thousand dollar debt canceled. And yet, can you imagine someone who's just had that big a debt just wiped off the record? Yeah, but that Bill Smith, that dirty rat, boy, I can't forget him. Look what he's done to me. Now, can you imagine that? Can you imagine how humans are? I, that's hard to imagine. You know, you think Jesus said you can blaspheme against the Father, it'll be forgiven. That's how big God is. You can blaspheme against the Son. You just forget it. Forgive it. Wipe it off the record. But you know what happens if you blaspheme against the brother in the church? Boy, you don't get forgiveness in this age, the age to come. I mean, you don't dare blaspheme against a, a deacon or an elder. You don't dare blaspheme against the older brother in the church. I mean, go ahead and blaspheme God. That'll be forgiven. Blaspheme the Son. It'll be forgiven. Just don't try it on humans. And that's a shame, but that's what this story is here to tell you. When you come to the Passover and you realize how much God has forgiven you, how dumb and stupid it is for us as humans to carry little old bitty, tiny, picky garbage around with us, feelings toward one another. When God Almighty has forgiven you $9,250,000, you don't forgive a brother that owes you $10, and $20, and $40, I don't care what it is, $100, $1,000, that's nothing. We don't forgive our wives, and we, our kids don't forgive parents, and 
God forgives you nine million and you don't forgive trivia. Picky nonsense. Well, the servant fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I'll pay you all. Well, then the Lord of that servant is moved with compassion, looses him, forgives him the debt. Nine million, two hundred and fifty thousand, just wiped right off the slate. But this very same person who had that big a debt forgiven him goes out and finds one of his fellow humans. All he does is owe him about fifteen dollars. That's all that amounts to, about fifteen dollars. He lays hands on him, takes him by the throat. You pay me what you owe me or I'll take it out of your hide. His fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay you all. Same exact words. But he wouldn't do it. He went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what's been done, they were very sorry, and they came and told the Lord all that was done. And then his Lord, now notice this, what's God going to do to you if he's forgiven you nine million, and you turn right around and carry grudges against one another? What's God going to do about it? He just going to ignore it and say, oh, well, that's Bill Smith's problem. And I know. Then his Lord, after he'd called him, said to him, Oh, you wicked servant, I forgave you nine million because you desired it. What about you? Shouldn't you have also had compassion on your fellow human as I had pity on you? And his Lord was raw. God gets angry about that. God doesn't look at that lightly. God was raw and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due. Now notice the lesson, verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do unto you, if you from your hearts don't forgive everyone his brother their trespasses. So you know, there's a danger coming to the Passover without that foot washing humility, without this forgiving, forgetting attitude, without that faith in God as your healer, you know, you've got time now to examine yourself. You've got over a couple of weeks to judge yourself, to examine yourself, to be sure you discern the Lord's body, to be sure you come with a foot-washing attitude, to be sure you leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled to your brother, to be sure you realize how much God is forgiving you so you can have that humble, forgiving attitude that foot washing depicts. Well, I hope we can all examine ourselves and judge ourselves and get in the right attitude we ought to have for Passover. And then when you do, you're going to come to the Passover with such enthusiasm and vigor because you realize how much you need it. You realize how much it means to you. And you realize really what Jesus said. If you don't eat his flesh or drink his blood, you have no part with him. So we've got time to get ourselves ready. So let's Really, look into our lives, and if you need to, get away for a day and just spend the day studying and praying and meditating and fasting and studying and praying and meditating, and you try that out. It'll be the best Passover you've ever had if you get yourself ready that way. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.